Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Papadakis. I'm one of the cardiologists at St. George's University of London, who works very closely with the uh, charitable organization Cardiac Risk in the Young. Uh, Cardiac Risk in the Young is dedicated to preventing sudden cardiac death in young individuals, but very importantly, is also dedicated to supporting young individuals who have been diagnosed with one of those conditions that predispose to sudden cardiac death. Uh, since 2002, uh, Mrs. Cox, the Chief Executive of Cardiac Risk in the Young, has established the My Heart Group, which supports those young individuals and gives them a platform where they can meet and exchange experiences, as well as uh, get advice relating to their condition. And what we have noticed over the years that there are a number of questions that come up in My Heart Group that are not covered comprehensively through the national health system that all those young individuals attend. And that particular question is about exercise. And it's about how much exercise and what sort of exercise can a young individual do once they've been diagnosed with an inherited cardiac condition. And in particular, if they have been considered at a significant risk and have been implanted with a device such as intracardiac defibrillator. So today, we're extremely fortunate to have uh, two of those young individuals. We've got Paula and we've got Joseph as well, that they've very kindly donated their time. And what we'll try to do over the next few minutes is go through the experience that Paula and Joseph had, that they were diagnosed with their condition and implanted with a defibrillator through the national health system, and the difficulty they had in identifying what sort of uh, exercise and how much exercise were they able to do. So we'll try to identify their experiences, the, the gaps that exist within our national health system, and how we have been able to help them through My Heart Group. Thank you very much both for coming today. So, uh, so we just get directly to the point. Would you, I, I would just like you to go through your experience through the national health system as to when you were diagnosed, what happened to you and what sort of advice you got relating to exercise. I was diagnosed with Brigada syndrome in 2011 after my brother died um, suddenly. Um, I was fitted with an ICD in 2012 and um, after having the ICD fitted I had a month off with no exercise um, which was um, told to me to do and then um, I, beforehand I exercised quite a lot, um, went to a lot of classes, that kind of thing and then um, after um, I didn't know how to go back into exercise, there was no um, no support really um, or advice on how to go back into exercise afterwards. Um, so I went back into exercise myself, I found it quite challenging um, and um, I was worried, didn't know what kind of exercise to do, what limits to take it to um, and obviously having the ICD implanted um, it causes a lot of restriction on your shoulder um, your muscles are moved about so you lose a lot of strength um, and then when you go back in, I found when I went back into exercise, it was moving about a lot, it hadn't settled properly. Um, I didn't know what exercises were safe to do, what exercises weren't safe to do, um, and what limits to take it to. So um, I, d I kind of um, worked it all out myself really, and took it gradually, um, and, um, and then after that, became a fitness instructor. So this is a very important point. So when young people and anyone gets implanted with a device that usually goes under the left collar bone, uh, what happens is that obviously the device is new to your body. Your body is getting accustomed to that device. It can move around quite a bit and the advice we usually give to people is that they shouldn't really do exercise, in t at least intense exercise for the first month. And also they should be careful with the movements that they do with their arms. So they should try and avoid to lift their arm above shoulder level, but that's just for the first four weeks. The other important point to make is that we don't want people to keep their arms still because we don't want that to become difficult. So they can move around, they can do their daily works and daily chores, but they shouldn't do any heavy lifting with that particular arm or try and catch up from up the self, that sort of restrictions. Did you have a similar experience to Paula, Joseph? My story is different to um, Paula's. Um, I had a cardiac arrest after running the 
Hastings Half Marathon in 2008. Um, I was then diagnosed with um, Brigada syndrome and I was implanted, implanted with an ICD. For me, there was no support. Um, it was, well, very minimal. They, they, they told me that I wouldn't be able to run again or do anything. Um, it was quite negative, to be, to be honest. I think it was from my first pacing test that um, I, I pushed and asked them about you know, what, what I can do, um, which then they um, booked me a treadmill test. For me, that wasn't sufficient enough because it was only like 20 minutes on, on a treadmill and I'd go, I'd go a lot further than that. So I didn't feel it was um, sufficient enough for me. I then contacted Cry and um, um, met up with the My Heart group. It's from there that I actually got um, the encouragement to actually start going back into fitness and um, going for runs again. I rejoined the gym. I'm now also a fitness instructor, and recently I've just um, completed a marathon. So, so guys, how were you told that your condition in the ICD will affect your ability to exercise? How did your consultant or physician that was attending address that? My consultant told me to take exercise um, gradually um, and do it at um, an even kind of level. You know, um, not over exercise. That was the main thing. So that was one of the things you're um, you're unsure on what what that limit is. Don't over exercise. I don't don't really know which level that you you could class that as. Um, and also, I was told not to do body pump anymore because of the weights. Um, so completely not to do it, which which um, upset me emotionally. Um, because that was one of my favourite classes and um, you know the ICD was a precaution and wanted to live a normal happy life afterwards. Um, so for the shock of having it implanted and then to be told afterwards that I had to reduce my exercise um, the, from what I previously did and I had to be careful and I had to cut out classes I did before, um, that was a bit of a shock for me um, to deal with as well as just being diagnosed. What about you Zosie? Um, for me, it was a um, traumatic experience um, because I think, um, having a cardiac arrest, um, I think that that, puts us, that scares you, you know, beyond anything because you're, you came that close to death. Um, so, you know, even when people tell you stuff, you just, I, I, even then, I don't think I took much of anything in. I, I was told that um, not to run again. I mean, that, that, that was one of the terms that I'm not to run again at all, which was a bit like not, not run at all. And this, that's what I do. I like running. It was my, it was my escape. I was literally told um, that I wouldn't be able to do any of that sort of stuff. Um, but they did, I mean, um, like I said, after my pacing test, they did say that my settings were set up higher because I was a young person and they expected me to go back to fitness. But it was never clear on what I could do and what I couldn't do. So it was. I felt like I was left in the dark at the time. So the impression that I get from both of you, more with Joseph rather than Paula, is that the advice was fairly informal and none of you received any formal exercise prescription mm. as such that would describe what can you do, how much and at what level. I also have found the, the advice different from different consultants as well, which was very confusing. Mm. Um, if it wasn't confusing in the first place, I found that that um, because some were saying you could do this and some were saying you couldn't do this um, so that that was quite confusing so in your view guys is there a better way of being told <coughs> what you can do and you can what you can't do after having your diagnosis I I personally think there would be yeah I think if you were told and they actually had facts behind what they were telling you um, and then they were to help you back into exercise or give you some sort of program to work towards and stages um, that would have been much much um, I would have been able to accept it easier. What about you? Yeah I would have to agree um, with Paula there because um, well there, there, were, there was really there was no guidance of anything so it was just you, you were just left left in the dark a little bit so um, so I get the impression from both of you that if you had some sort of specifics regarding the advice, uh, regarding what you can and you cannot do, and at what intensity you can do it, then you'll probably be more satisfied with so that sort of advice and more likely to follow it mm -hmm. compared to being told not to do anything on a more or less casual basis. Yeah. 
and the advice was the same from from all the different um, consultants. Cause that and I have to say, in my experience, you're absolutely right in that. Uh, and obviously, one of the problems that we've got, as you highlight, Joseph, plenty of times, is that we do deal with a variety of conditions. Some of them we know better than others, and that's why there is a gap in our knowledge, particularly with exercise prescription. And that's why in a lot of situations it ends up being a casual discussion rather than a formal discussion followed by specific advice. How being within my heart group did help you in that sort of aspect? Did you manage to speak to other individuals who had similar experience? Did you manage to get any advice? Was it helpful at all? Yeah, I found it very helpful, did you? Yeah, I found it very helpful because um, I, I didn't get back into the gym straight away. I didn't, it, like I said, it was three, four months. I had my um, treadmill test, but even then I wasn't confident enough to go back. Um, it was through the My Heart groups that I actually, after meeting other people and talking to them, that actually gave me the, well, the encouragement um, to actually go for a run again. Because everybody felt the same as yeah. well, didn't they, in those groups? Absolutely. They were all worried about Nobody had gone back to exercise. So how did you get started, Joseph, then? So you had you said the experience within my cry, my heart group, and then how did you go about it, getting back to exercise? Well, um, yeah, I was, like I said, I was encouraged. We made some friends um, through um, my heart group. <coughs> um, we were talking through on Facebook and... Um, they're always like, going, you know, you can do it, and um, so I put on I put on my run shoes and I messaged everyone on Facebook saying I'm going for a run for the first time, and I had lots of messages of support saying, you know, you can do it, you'll be fine. I mean, admit I, the first time I went for a run was actually quite scary because, you know, it's it's always in the back of the mind that something's going to happen, um, but um, nothing happened, and then I think from then on I just moved forward, which um, I then rejoined a gym. That's um, from then, um, I, I think I went a bit crazy with my fitness a little bit right at the beginning because I was like really pushing myself, going on to like cross trainers and trying to get my heart rate as high as I could and it's just like saying, how high can I get my heart rate? I thought it was just like, sort, of, sort of a challenge. Um, um, yeah, that was... Regarding getting on the treadmill and giving it all, did you have any advice from your ICD or from your doctor, from the National Health System, as to how much you were able to do, or how fast you could go? No, no, no. Unfortunately, um, I mean, I didn't even know how far I could go for a run or what distance. I mean, when, like I said, when I had my um, cardiac arrest, that was a half marathon. Mm. That's thirteen miles. I, when I go for a run, I can't do anything less than an hour. I, I like to go for a long distance. I, it's that's my natural. Ability, I can't just do a short run or just 10, 20 minutes. I like to go for distance. So for me, um, I kind of felt, I wish I'd had a bit more guidance on what I could do or what I couldn't do. But yet again, I don't think a doctor could go to you. Yes, you can go this far because obviously they didn't really know themselves at the time and they probably still don't actually. So how do you feel about your ICD now? Um, now, initially, obviously it was, um, it was, um, very alien and big, yeah, quite um, intrusive in, in your body. I'm very aware of it, um, and it, it is large in your chest. So emotionally, it's it's one of those things that's always on your mind, um, and you're very aware that it's there. What about you? Um, at first, I resented it. Didn't like it. Didn't want it. Um, I knew why it was there. It was important f um, for me. Um, but I didn't like it at all. Um, I've, I've, I've grown to love it. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, I know it's there to save my life. Um, I mean, I'm, I've been very fortunate enough that um, I've never received any shock therapy, and I touch wood, I hope never to receive a shock therapy. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, it's there if something was to happen. So, you know, it's going to save my life. So, yes. I mean, I used to call it my little soap box because it's like a little soap for me. It just felt like a bit of, I got a, a bar of soap in my chest. But, um, but no, it's, it's, it's a part of me now, so I'm, I'm used to it. And it's, I think I may hate it if I ever get that shock. But um, for now, it's, you know, it's there to save my life. So even, even when I do get that shock, I'll probably be thankful for it, just that I'll hate it at that, at that one moment. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask you something particular? So 
I get the impression that the, in the beginning you didn't like it was more of a burden rather than mm. a benefit having it there. Has, however, over time they actually given you the confidence to do the things that you wanted to do, like going back into exercise? Um, yeah, I, I, for me, I think I think so. I mean, because it's, it's especially when you go to the patient test, they uh, they usually just like ask you what are you doing at this time or that that time, um, and nothing's ever shown up when I've been exercising. It's only when I've been sleeping. So it's like it's like you know when I did a Spartan race, it's nothing showed up on that day, or when I've like done classes or done anything fitness, it's always a time where I've been asleep. So it's like you know it's it's okay. I can still do the things that I want to do. Is um, if anything, I must be concerned about going to sleep. Mm. I, I find um, uh, we've been so involved with leisure centres and that, um, a lot of the staff there, it would worry me if I didn't have an ICD, to all those people that don't and obviously are unaware if they do have a heart condition, but the, re the um, sort of procedures in place, if somebody did drop down in your class, you know, so in some ways I feel that at least if something did happen, you know, you're going to you've got that um, straight away. So it gives you that confidence. Did you being told that you should be limited make you a bit more adventurous as to what sort of exercise or how much exercise you're doing? It made me want to know why and, um, and the reasons behind um, being told that and um, what basis um, it, um, that knowledge came from. So that's what I, I went forward to. Try. But the fact that you didn't, did that make you react in a different way compared to if you had all that information? It did make me want to find out why and carry on my normal life, yeah. And how did you arrive to the conclusions that you did arrive and go on to the gym and go on to the exercise that you do? Um, <clears throat> after doing a medical live research with you, <laughs> Um, on, on um, studies that have been done in the UK um, and seeing the lack of knowledge and then um, going on my own really to back into rehabilitation and taking it to the levels that I wanted to um, and thankfully everything was okay because of my condition and everything being okay to exercise again afterwards. So essentially from uh, the literature search or the internet says that you did, yeah. you felt that you had the power to challenge the sort of advice in a way that was given to you or the advice that wasn't given to you. What about you, Joseph? Um, well, it took me a little bit longer, but um, for me, um, the moment they said to me, <coughs> I could never run a marathon again, I think there was always that little burning desire in, my, in me to actually go, no, I'm going to do it. Um, which, you know, I only did it recently. Um, it took me seven years, but I finally found the, cur the, the courage to actually go and do it. Um, but by, um, in that time, I've built up my fitness tenfold. I, I've, I think I've pushed myself even harder now than I back, back before then. And I've, I've, I think it's because I have this condition, I like to challenge myself a bit more, which um, I, f I think I'm probably a bit of a headache for some of my doctors. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the problem with, um, when, when I uh, was diagnosed um, in 2008, I was told a lot of time that they were learning, they were learning from me what I can do and what you couldn't do because they still didn't know much themselves. They was they were learning from me. So and there was lots of times I was going to different doctors and they were getting lots of different questions. Um, and I, you know I was telling them about my condition um, a lot of times. So yeah, it was different for me. Just a last question. So do you feel that your current state? Obviously, both of you are exercising quite a lot, you're both essentially fitness instructors. Do you feel that there is any limitation to how much exercise you should be doing? And do you feel that there are occasions that it goes through your mind that you've actually exceeded those sort of limitations? Mm. I'm just trying to understand what the thought process will be. I mean, that's always in my mind every time I um, take myself to those limits, exercise-wise. Um, <clears throat> but on the other side, because I've got the ICD, um, it kind of gives me that reassurance that um, even if I even if I did take it to that level, um, I'd be okay anyway because it's a precaution um, there. What about you, Joseph? So what I want to understand in a way what was the thought process before making the decision to go that extra step, which I think most of us will agree that it's probably a bit more than what you will be advised to do? Yeah, um, 
I, I don't know if there's a, it's a thought process for me in that, in that one. Um, I, I tend to listen to my body more now, though. Um, what I mean by that is that <coughs> um, if I've got a cold or if I'm not well, I won't train. I'm listening to my body. I know if something's not right, I won't train, I won't do anything. Because um, one, one of the things that I remember from the Hastings Half Marathon is that the week before I had a cold and then I did, did the half marathon and I know that my body wasn't fully recovered from the cold and I think, I mean, I don't know if that's the, the real reason, but I think that's one of the, the contributions to having my cardiac arrest is that my body wasn't fully recovered. So every time I don't feel well, I don't train, I listen to my body, I listen to, you know, if, if something doesn't feel right, I don't do it. So I'm always, I think you just listen to your body more and you, you trust your own instincts. Okay, and I think it's very important for the young individuals within her conditions and probably ICDs that are listening to us to highlight a few important points, uh, which I think have been highlighted throughout our discussion. But the first point is that exercise is beneficial for you and the exercise we're promoting is moderate degree of exercise on a regular basis. Uh, not all individuals can do the sort of exercise that Paul and Joseph are able to do. They both have a specific condition called Brugada syndrome, which is less, mal it's far more benign compared to other conditions, particularly in relation to exercise. And the other important point is that for everyone, we want individualized and tailored advice, because even in your cases, guys, you should have been advised that yes, you can do a marathon, but that in that marathon it's important as to the sort of level that you go at. And also it's very important that you keep yourself well hydrated. There are, you don't provoke any abnormal electrol any electrolyte abnormalities within your body. And also you avoid the sort of sports that can increase your body temperature to the extent that may predispose you to irregular heartbeats. That may promote a shock from your ICD. So for every single individual, it's important that they go through that sort of process with their doctor and they've got the right advice and the right sort of exercise they can participate in.